using MySQL as active database for monitoring um, applications. My presentation really um, is about software architecture for monitoring applications. Monitoring systems are very important uh, in our life, and I'm going to show that the usage of active databases uh, makes them more efficient. Here is the outline. Um, in the introduction, I explained uh, the problem using, uh, I'm going to explain the problem using simple example and show the proposed solution. After that, I apply the solution to more generic type of um, monitoring system and show how it works. Um, next, I will explain the principles of building rules engine, uh, which is the heart of proposed monitoring architecture. Once we finish the theoretical part, uh, I will show how particular database, namely MySQL, um, could be used to implement the ADBMS functionality. And in the summary, I will formulate the result and conclude the presentation. And here is an introduction. Um, in the introduction, I start from a simple example of inventory monitoring system and explain what kind of problem it has. After that, I show how it could be improved using active database. And next, I will analyze more realistic examples and show how active databases could improve their functionality <coughs> as well. Uh, there are some uh, technical systems who look similar on, uh, at, at first glance. But uh, once you take the architecture of one system and apply it to another, you discover that it doesn't work well. I think this is the case with monitoring applications. Yes, they look similar with business or, uh, or uh, enterprise systems. Uh, but uh, the same architecture doesn't work well. Um, let's take, for example, uh, the simple system monitoring the inventory of paper boxes at some warehouse. Uh, periodically, uh, the paper boxes taken out of warehouse and the system has to order new ones. It's really very simple indeed. Uh, the system has conventional uh, database with an inventory table. It has monitoring application. Uh, and rules prescribing what to do when items are taken out of the database. The rule says, if uh, there are less than five items in inventory table, order new items. Not a big deal. Uh, the mo inventory uh, monitoring application periodically pulls the database to check how many items in the table. It pulls and checks and pulls and checks and pulls and checks and finally, reordering new items. As you can see, the <laughs> system is not very efficient. If you have high polling rates, you waste a lot of resources. Uh, bandwidth, uh, database uh, server resources, application server resources, and you do that only in order to know that nothing changed yet. If you have lower polling rate, now you've got another problem, because you're losing mm, responsiveness and got bad accuracy. Well, moreover, if you have multiple applications involved, now you have to replicate the same functionality over and over. Um, code replication is not a good idea. Also, if you decided to change your inventory database, now you have to upgrade all your applications. So you see, in addition to the waste of resources, you definitely have architectural problems here. Um, so, um, as you can see, monitoring with conventional databases cannot be implemented efficiently. <coughs> and the reason for that is very simple. Because uh, conventional uh, DBMS does not know that application <coughs> is polling it. How situation changes if you bring um, active DBMS? I intentionally didn't tell you the definition of a DBMS. First, see how it works and it will be easy to understand the definition later. It also has a database with inventory table. However, the inventory table now has a trigger, which is reacting to the changes in the database state when items are taken out. Uh, the rules are the same, um, and here is the algorithm. 
if event happened, means inventory changed, trigger fires, and condition check happened, to check in with the less than five, if condition is satisfied, rules applied, and action executed. It means uh, <coughs> new items are ordered. Let's see how it works. I take the first item. Trigger fire. <laughs> but nothing changed because condition is not satisfied yet. I took another item. Trigger fire. Nothing changed because condition is not satisfied yet. I took the third item. Trigger fired. Condition is satisfied and new items are reordered. Now you can see the difference between active database and conventional one. The conventional one only uh, respond to the calls from application. The active database can detect the event and based on that um, detection could do some predefined action if uh, conditions um, aren't met. Um, the active databases are significantly more powerful than the passive ones because they implement the functionality which in passive databases has to be encoded in multiple applications. Um, so, um, how um, monitoring system architecture with active DBMS compares with conventional one? Uh, with active DBMS architecture, has better efficiency because there is no polling and checking. It has less components because there is no special monitoring component. It has better integration integration with other DBMS features like store procedures, like functions, because now you can call them directly from the database. It has better modularity because the change detection code now is isolated from application code and centralized. What the centralization gives to us? The obvious answer, oh, it's easy to maintain. That's true, but this is not the most fundamental advantages. One of the advantage, advantages is uniformity of rules and data interpretation. And we as database people know how important it is. Now all applications have to use the same rules. And the same rules interpret data the same way. And that's quite good. Um, also, it is interesting to notice that the separation of knowledge about data changes from application became beneficial for everybody. Application became simpler, code became more modular, and database does less work. It means that knowledge about data changes does not belong to application and should be in database instead. I think this conclusion is counterintuitive, but it is definitely true. But, you see, um, now we will talk about centralization of knowledge. Um, there is another very important consequence of uh, this knowledge centralization. Once it has been centralized, it has become possible to share. Why it is so important to share? It is important because now one application could be aware about data changes in another one. The question is why one application should even care about data changes in another one? <coughs> in order to understand, let's look at the railroad ticket inventory monitoring where multiple monitoring application, applications work with the central database. Let's suppose we have multiple small local travel offices and customers who wants to go to the big city. We also have central database um, containing the inventory of all railroad tickets. At the local station one, customer um, wants to buy a ticket to the central station in the big city for the train between 9 and 10 a.m. The agent runs the local ticket monitoring application and returns with no ticket for this time response. A very different, but very similar to local station 2. Customer comes and wants to buy a ticket for the train between 9 and 10 a.m. to the central station. Agent 2 checks, the, checks and returns with no, no ticket for this time response. At the local um, station M, customer M wants to buy a ticket for the train between 9 and 10 a.m. The agent runs local travel monitoring application and returns with no tickets for this time response. Mm -hmm. 
Of course, it is not, not good that all customers couldn't get their ticket. But what is really bad, that every customer and every sales travel agent sees this situation as a local one, which, some, which happened only to them, is something very unique. Nobody can stand up and say, and say, hey, maybe we should do something. 100 customers couldn't get uh, tickets for the train. Maybe we should change our schedule. Maybe we should increase the number of trains. <coughs> Maybe at least we can mark down that situation and see how often it repeats itself. Yes, we can do that, but only if the knowledge about failed responses is shared. And that is the key. Knowledge uh, independence enables centralization. And centralization makes knowledge sharing easy. To make the case more apparent, let's consider two objects in 3D space. They are close to each other only if they are, each of their 3D coordinates is close to each other at the same time. What it means is that here time and space became interchangeable. And now we have two 4D objects. If you store those, geogra those coordinates in geographically distributed servers, it is very difficult, difficult to check the closeness of objects in real time. That's a sharing. Now let's see what, we, what happened if we bring ADVMS into a road ticket monitoring system. First, we got some benefits. Uh, the first benefit will be instantaneous notification of all applications when the ticket is sold. Agents no longer have to request information. They are automatically in sync uh, with the central inventory after each change. Second, once the events are stored in the database, they are available for, mm, pattern, for event pattern analysis. And such analysis would instantaneously find problem with the schedule. Uh, the analysis should be done after each change in the database to evaluate the importance of the new event and its influence on the organization operation. Uh, you can see that the monitoring activity has two levels. The lower level deals with single events and individual um, monitoring application. But higher level works with the groups. It works with event pattern analysis and, the in, and it influences the decision-making process. Now I would like to uh, present another monitoring example demonstrating the vital importance of event pattern analysis and knowledge sharing. Mm -hmm. And here I'm talking about video monitoring. There are about 14,000 closed circuit TV cameras in London on the ground and about 400,000 in London, in London only. The total number of cameras in the UK is about 4 million, so it's about 14 people per camera. However, the video monitoring produces so much data that only an attack justifies the number of people necessary to analyze those tapes. Could active databases help to solve some of those problems? Let's look at the principles of preventive monitoring. The, principle, uh, the principles say don't track individuals, track the activity. Uh, because it is very important, the identification of the ongoing activity is more important than the recognition of particular individuals. It is a matter of highest importance to know whether the activity under question actually exists or it is just a bunch of unrelated events. But what is an activity? Activity is an ordered sequence of seemingly unsuspicious events. The events them themselves are not so important. What's important is that they signify some ongoing activity. Only taken together as a group, as an ordered sequence, they reveal the activity which they associ associated with. Those principles allow significantly reduce the amount of analyzed data by introducing the relations between events generated by video servers. By video sensors, sorry. If the features of activity are known in advance, a lot of events could be filtered out automatically because they don't fit into activity event 
pattern. Correspondingly, the events which fit into a specified pattern could be found automatically, and once the complete set is identified, the notification could be sent to a decision system. This action could be executed before the actual attack. So this type of surveillance could be called preventive monitoring. Of course, all the steps for preventive monitoring could be done not necessarily by active database, but some custom applications as well. However, this is true, the active database approach has some important advantages. The major one is usage of SQL and relational technology, which is pretty standard. It provides data independence and allows easy communication between different monitoring systems. <laughs> After um, another consideration is the data centralization, which enforces uniform, consistent behavior among different applications. Now, once we learn how to use active databases for specific monitoring tasks, we could try to create generic monitoring application architecture. First, we'll show how a single event is going to be created and processed. Next, we'll describe the event table where the search for patterns happen. After that, we will explain the rules engine and sequence of steps necessary to generate the notification message for the decision system. And then we will show the whole monitoring system architecture, including rules engine. The first step in designing a DMS monitoring system is to allow the sensor to create an event. The sensor monitors the environment, collects the data, and plays them into the database as a record. However, there is a difference between sensor data, like an image, and an event. Mm. Event corresponds only to the changes in the environment which are important for monitoring, which makes sense, like a presence of particular object. To recognize the existence of those changes in the data acquired by the sensor, we need external application, which examines the data and converts them into an event. There are so-called smart sensors, which could analyze the data by themselves and produce an event. In such case, sensor generates high output and places it directly into event data. Every time when new event is inserted into events table, the event trigger fires. This firing launches rules engine which scans the event table in search of a pattern. Once, once such a pattern is found, the rules engine sends the notification to the decision system. You can see how it happened. You see, the scanning happened. It scans. Now it sends notification to the decision system. Yeah, I can try to do that again. It scans, and if the pattern found, it sends the notification to the decision system. At the next slide, we will see the whole uh, architecture. First, we see monitored environment, which could be wherever you want. It could be uh, forests which are under fire. It could be any other. Um, environment under monitoring. <coughs> you see here the sensor collecting data, placing them into the table, and um, external application which analyzes the data and produces the events. <coughs> after that, you see I, from multiple sensors, it essentially produces multiple events which create so-called events cloud. And events cloud are inserted into events table. Inside the events table, all these different events essentially put into order. They timestamp, they uh, know the sequence in which they come, and they produce essentially event stream. And that <coughs> event stream is analyzed by the rules engine in search of a pattern. Once pattern is found, the notification is sent to the decision system. Um, I already mentioned that um, the identification of event pattern is done by the rules engine. Sometimes we call it event pattern or composite events. And the design of the, uh, the rules engine is based on the event theory. Uh, this section is actually a theoretical foundation for the design of monitoring system. First, I briefly describe the theory of events, primitive and composite events, and after that triggers and ECA rules. According to the event theory, 
each um, event um, is a recorded environment change. For the database, the event definition is just change in the database state. Events have many important aspects. They have a form, how event is represented. For example, in the, in the database, they represent as a tuple. Uh, they have significant, significance. How event signifies the activity, because each event is a sign of activity. Event relativity, how event relates to other events, causality, who caused the events, time when event happened, event aggregation, does the event contains other events, and events recurrence, do the events belong to the same type. So now we have event classes and event instances. Um, events could be divided by two groups, primitive event, events and composite events. Primitive events don't contain other events, but uh, composite events do. And here's the list of primitive events, like vocabulary. And uh, the next slide, you see the composite events which are produced <coughs> from primitive events using event algebra. And here you have um, event algebra operations. Um, and there is a quite a bit of them. What's important that mm, in order to produce, to generate composite event, the operations is not enough. You also have to use, um, for combining them together, uh, some kind of policy. They call it, mm, for combining together, cons consummation policy or consumption policy. And there are four types of consumption policy. Uh, there are, um, for example, here in, in example, there are different type of consumption policy. Here in the case of three events, A1, A2, and B, those are primitive events, and they produce event E. If um, we use um, recent policy, yeah, better. Yeah. Um, if we use a recent policy, um, the E co mm, uh, contains only A2 and B. If uh, we use chronicle policy, uh, the event contains A1 and B. And if cumulative policy is used, there are all events A1, A, A2, and B compose uh, event E. Um, here, um, I describe the triggers or active rules. Uh, they define the reaction of the database to the, to, 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 the, to the event. And the syntax of that actually was originated in expert systems, but it is most flexible because now we have events. Uh, the expert systems don't have events, but active databases do. It is useful to have events and rules because condition is expensive to evaluate, uh, whereas detecting an event is less complex, mm -hmm. especially uh, for applications with very large databases. In addition, mm -hmm. We can specify different actions for different events using the same condition. Uh, yeah, those are kind of production rules, and uh, um, who recognizes the events. Now the theoretical part is over, and we can think uh, how in real life uh, the active DBMS actually created, uh, who makes them. Uh, and uh, I would like to show uh, that uh, um, using MySQL we actually can create active uh, DBMS, but we have to do something about it. I took MySQL, you know, because I know that it's popular, it's good, fast and reliable. What's interesting is <coughs> that usually it is considered as lagging behind other databases in functionality. It means that we shouldn't expect to see it as an example of ADBMS which requires additional functionality comparing with conventional databases. Nevertheless, I will show that the latest version of MySQL is enough features to be considered as ADBMS. In addition to this enhanced functionality, MySQL still retains the simplicity, speed, and reliability. So if we think about open source, it's worth to consider. In this section, I will explain MySQL triggers, messaging, events, and user-defined functions, and show that together they fulfill most of the ADBMS requirements. Let's start with trigger and act or act rules, main functionality required by databases. You see MySQL triggers support all major operations on tables, 
and are used for many different purposes, essentially to maintain or propagate the database <coughs> state. Uh, and here you will see the example of the trigger syntax. It's actually very typical uh, syntax similar to Oracle, SQL Server, DB2, and it satisfies ADBMS requirements. <laughs> the next feature, messaging, is more complex, but also a very powerful one. It is interesting that MySQL Server can send and receive messages across the network using simple MySQL queries, and I did it, and it's really very nice. Messaging is not a standard part of MySQL Server, but has to be added using user-defined function. In my work, I use it with a spread toolkit. Uh, it is a very useful feature because, for example, it allows you to start up your own application on any network-connected computer just running MySQL query. And most of work actually uh, done by James Duncan, who, uh, who linked together uh, that spread toolkit or described how to do that. Uh, and MySQL. He wrote scripts which help to do that. Uh, it is not very difficult, actually, but there are some kind of few gotchas. You have to know how to add the UDF to your MySQL uh, server. Um, so mm, let's, uh, the spread toolkit is very popular and has been in production for more than five years. It is easy, relatively easy to install and runs on all major platforms. For example, it is used in the Postgres database for replication. So it is really very reliable. It's, it's a good, good software. Open source, of course, created by John Hopkins. And quite fast. Now let's see how um, we can use messaging to start up application from MySQL. Mm. Um, this slide shows the monitoring application, MySQL server and spread server, all run on the same computer, but this is just for the sake of simplicity. In real life, they will run on a separate machine. The application will be launched by a spread server, um, which listen to the messages from specific message group. And um, first, the database sends the message by running. You see, the MySQL server sends the message by running query. <coughs> send message to spread toolkit by running the Query. This is a special query. Um, once you um, added your user-defined function to the MySQL server, now you can use that um, select statement with a user-defined function. And look, it is very simple. You use select statement, send message. Uh, there is a, um, in, in, in quotes, you have name of the group orders, and byte array contains the data if you want to pass. Sometimes you don't want. The yeah, orders is a message group. You see message group green one. And by the way, is a message payload. And now, um, the spread toolkit, uh, the spread toolkit, um, spread daemon receives the messages because spread daemon runs on the machine where your application runs. And using spread APIs, which has been linked to your application, you have to link your application with a spread API. It starts your uh, application. Um, it's about eight lines of code. Spread has two APIs, C for C language and for Java. And I was able to do that um, relatively quickly. It is not difficult at all, I would say. And uh, I can start up my application wherever I want. Uh, not too much configuration, actually. That's it. And it, it, it is great, I would say. Um, so now we can go to the next interesting feature useful for a new uh, They are uh, MySQL events, which are relatively new addition to MySQL. Uh, they do exist. I use them in 5.1 point I took latest like 12 or something, but I think they exist from 5.12 or something, but they are syntax and functionality improved in the latest uh, releases. What they do in reality, I use the word events, but those are very different events than the one which I talked before. Essentially, MySQL events are temporal triggers, which allows you to do jobs similar to what you do with a cron. If you know what cron is doing, that's essentially the thing, but you can <coughs> done it from the database. 
a lot, in a lot of situations, it's useful to have scheduled task executed at specific time when you work with a database. For example, you know that uh, you want to read, delete some tables uh, from the database at specific time. You want to scan some tables in search of something at specific time or at specific periodicity. That what essentially um, that uh, mechanism is doing. And I like how they implemented that. Um, you have three time, three types, actually, uh, actually two types of um, scheduled events. One time, so you set up a time like Monday, 19, uh, 2007, January, uh, the three o'clock p.m. or something, and you have a you have a recurrent uh, schedule event. <coughs> so you can repeat it um, with some periodicity, not faster than one second, I think not faster than that, but it's usually enough. And it is very convenient, the syntax is quite reasonable, I will show that. Um, and it does work, so every time when trigger fires, it executes some statement. It could be a store procedure, it could be a bunch of uh, um, SQL statements, whatever, whatever you want. There are some gotchas, but very few actually. For example, uh, you can have many scheduled events, but you have to remember that each event is a thread, independent thread, which starts up. So your granularity, how simultaneously you can start up your event, is a little bit shaky, for it, it unlikely less than, the average is, is not less than one second, that type of thing. So it's not real time, but close to that. Uh, and here the syntax, you can create an event on schedule every week, do insert something into, into some table. Uh, you can create on, on one time schedule event. Look, yeah, the, uh, they use a timestamp for, uh, for, for setting time, which makes sense. Just reuse uh, already existing constructions. And you do, you insert something into, into the table. You have to turn on event scheduler, otherwise you don't, uh, uh, you, the, the event will not be executed. You can drop it and you can alter that. Unfortunately, um, they didn't implement some functionality which I am asking them to create relative events. So you can schedule an event like 30 minutes later than another. And the starting type, starting time of your relative event is automatically changing when your reference event uh, is changing, the time is changing. It is nice because now you can make sure that your new data came like in 30 minutes after the, f after the start of the first, first check. So you can actually verify the time windows in the database, which is very interesting functionality. And it's usable for active databases. And now my kind of last um, interesting addition to MySQL UDFs. UDFs, of course, it's not a new topic. Uh, a lot of people did it, um, but uh, it's very useful. But I did it first time, and I was amazed by their, po their, by their po power. Using UDFs, you actually can successfully communicate with the operating system, which runs your database. And this is so powerful that it's even dangerous. Uh, what you can do, you can download into your database binary application from your client and save your binary application on the server and start it up. Yeah, it is a something kind of hack, but it is interesting. Um, of course, you have to, you know, uh, have a, uh, right privileges, and when you write your UDS, you have to follow specific rules. I will say a little bit about that. Yeah. Mm. You can, for example, scan tables, not using SQL, just, just writing the C program. And so look how it is done. Actually, I spent quite a bit of time figuring it out. That is not simple, not for the, uh, you know, weak-hearted people. Uh, yeah, you created the file, uh, the C file, of course it is in C or C++. You have to define specific fixed names uh, in your uh, .c file, which I initially forgot to do, and I couldn't install it, just didn't install. Uh, you have to compile it uh, using GCC. I am talking about Linux. I don't talk about Windows. In Windows, you have to use Visual C++. And I don't do that. 
Um, but in Linux, it's the uh, usual Linux JCC compiler, and it does work. You have to link it, and link it in a special way. There are some kind of predefined format of names. And after that, which is very important, to copy your object file into a user lib directory. User lib for Red Hat. If you have Debian, it's different. If you have uh, SUSE, it's probably different as well. So that is a kind of gotcha. Uh, and it is very difficult to figure out why it doesn't work, why you cannot install it in the database. But once it's installed, you see you run this uh, uh, command, uh, create function, and uh, it, you see in the, in the table there is a mysql.func. And um, in the table, you see that uh, that function installed. Once it is installed, uh, you can use it. And I use, for example, in order to do ls command. And I put output of the ls command into some file. And that's also an interesting thing. MySQL runs on, on the server as a MySQL user. You know, you have to add user, MySQL user, and it's independent user. That's how they manage security. It's actually a very typical thing. Spread toolkit runs the same way there is a spread user. Uh, Postgres database runs the same way. But uh, if you want to use, to, to download something into your server, especially offload from the server into something, you cannot do that. In, you cannot do that in any directory. You have to use either TMP directory because it's open for everybody. Or, and that's what I did, or you can download it into MySQL user directory, but there is no such. You know that when you created your database, you use a user, but there is no directives associated with that. Because those commands which create users, they have multiple formats, and that format which MySQL recommends does not create any directive. And I said, why I cannot change that? So I changed it and started to download that stuff, and, and I became MySQL user. And I see how it works. Yeah, I, the, the interesting things, actually. Yeah, you can start up applications from over there. Yeah, it's a little bit weird, but it can be done. And uh, I think it has some potential of uh, distributing your application to another computer. Because now, what do you do? You have to use uh, RCP, which is not a good idea. Because you really don't want to deal with the operating system when you send your file or something else to another computer. To deal with the operating system is a pain in the neck. User privileges, you know, all of that stuff. You know, you have to be root, and it's a pain in the neck. Just open Pandora box. With database, it's different. Because database in exists independently of operating system. So you use database which you know how to deal with. And that's nice. I found it is. Uh, it is good, uh, yeah. It is similar like a, like a server, which you use uh, for sending files between systems as well. So in reality, this is my summary. Uh, the Active DBMS improves the efficiency of the monitoring applications. Uh, the centralized shared event knowledge between application allows monitoring uh, complex events. Preventive monitoring could be implemented using the field of events and active databases. And of course, MySQL in the latest edition has all necessary features to be used as an active database for preventing monitoring applications. That's it. Do you have a demo application implemented with, with this that we can see somewhere? Um, I run it on my Linux machine. Uh, I, this is Windows. And I do have a MySQL on Windows, but I don't work really with uh, MySQL on Windows. I run it on, on Linux. No, I, I'm not asking you to do a demo right now, but I'm asking what, what it, I can Because it, it, there's a fair amount of idiosyncratic uh, uh, ways of doing things for uh, MySQL. So it would be nice to have a sample application that we can, we can access. There is no really application per se. The most of efforts went into setting things up. Compiler properly, compile properly. The file, the text of the file is very simple. I can send it, of course, it's no, no, no secret at all. And uh, MySQL has uh, some user example which also could be done. I can send it, there is no, uh, there is no secret at all. Uh, 
you, if you look at the slide, yeah, yeah this that slide is essentially, that's what it is. Is the slide accessible somewhere? Mm, sharing, yeah, oh, it will be definitely accessible from, um, from uh, my school conference, because I'm going to present it. And I believe, I can, send, I can email you that slide. If you give me the slides, I can post it. The MySQL Forge has right. the list yeah, of presentations. Yeah, and yeah. I can put it when I post the video. I can post the slides, mm -hmm. too, so that... We usually do that. I know my previous slides also have been yep. handled the same way, so it's not a problem at all. With this, um, when you say that a, a trigger can be off of a single event, how many triggers can you have you tested off of an event? For I tested um, how many, at least not less than three. Okay. Because, uh, but in reality, you have, have uh, I work with triggers for quite a bit, trying to measure the performance of the triggers. And it is interesting that I did it <laughs> working together with Harrison Fisk. Um, he, he's a famous guy. He's a very good guy. He worked at MySQL and very knowledgeable. And I was very proud when I got an email, email from him. Jacob, I learned something new. <laughs> yeah, what we try to do, I try to measure what kind of performance I can have uh, using triggers to insert records in the database. Mm -hmm. And I found that triggers provided the highest performance among all, at least three ways to do that. Uh, you can do that, you know, directly, you know, just running, you have a client, and you can just, you know, do that. You can create store procedure, you can do that. You can use embedded SQL on the server side. Mm -hmm. That's what Harrison essentially did it. I can begin want to spend too much time learning these things. But Harrison did it, you know, like... And of course you can use triggers. Mm -hmm. And I do have um, numbers. I did send them to Harrison as well. Because he was very surprised by the number. Um, the insertion using trigger was about at least 30%. 25, 30% faster than embedded SQL, which was uh, the fastest among the rest of that stuff. I was very, so it sounds like the triggers, I, I used to think the triggers, you know, it's a big deal, it's, you know, whole machinery, not really. Do use triggers, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, they, I never used, you know, the whole trigger system, I read that if you have like a hundred, hundreds of triggers, it's difficult to, the design is difficult. Now you have to remember which table has what. And that was my idea to rec for the request of grouping things mm -hmm. uh, um, in, 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 in time, in scheduled events. Because um, it's not easy to group triggers, really. They're plain. Uh, so, um, but at least working with 10, I didn't find too much trouble with that. But they're really fast. Yeah. Okay. Because when you're talking about, you know, in England, when you're doing video surveillance, you've got a data warehouse worth of data. And so if you're looking for patterns, I was just wondering how many you could be grouping at any given time because you're parsing so much data and you're looking for so many rules that would be off the same data. And so if you trigger that, how many things could you trigger at one time to parse through that warehouse full of data? This is an interesting question, but I would not I would be careful with the word <laughs> warehouse. I still would use it more like, it's not, yeah, it may be warehouse, but kind of it for, for me it looks a little bit like operational data store as well. Okay. Uh, uh, you're right that we don't remove uh, events once they got in, so it really looks like warehouse. But um, I don't think I have to. I have to scan the whole warehouse for these things. First, I can I can um, um, split it or somehow um, that uh, could improve the performance. You're right. I think the firing the trigger is very short time. Mm -hmm. the scanning the whole table using multiple rules, that's that, that time time consuming. But what I think, it is not as time consuming as people might think, because we don't scan images. 
we scan events. Mm -hmm. And what events is, it's very simple things, yes and time. That's what it is. So you can scan it relatively quickly. Okay. Yeah, but it is interesting. Yeah, remark, and I, I like about the thing about performance. Uh, I didn't implement that stuff in kind of real thing, but I hope to do that. Okay. Though you could use the messaging system. The trigger could only send a message, and then the other system could take over. So just oh, right. The thought, oh, right. Thought process. Uh, yes. But uh, in this case, you have to use rule engine as a client and read from the server. That no, but I'm just saying that the thing right. in a different process can take take charge and go from there. Right, right. Yes, I found. Yeah, yeah I, I remember uh, questions. Uh, yeah, I like this idea of um, uh, messaging because it compartmentalizes your stuff. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. You off, you offload a lot of things from your database server. Mm -hmm. That's what I really love. That's good idea. Uh, is is the message a subscription based or is it? It's a, it's a published subscribe. Okay. Um, it's mm -hmm. kind of inherited. You know, this, sub, this messaging and all this stuff, mm -hmm. there is a lot of confusion. Uh, it, is, it is a group subscription. So when you install this spread, ser uh, spread server, uh, you provide the list of machines which are able to receive messages from that, um, from the server. Essentially, you're creating a group. So you provide essentially IP addresses in some way to that. And the spread server multicasts those messages using UDP to all those machines. Uh, if you didn't subscribe to the group, your daemon, spread daemon, filters out those messages and you don't receive them. But um, if you do, you got it. Yeah. But uh, again, I highly recommend Spread Demon. I was surprised. It is very resilient. I talked to those guys who developed that. It is free. It is almost like MySQL. It's supported by a commercial company. Kind of a small company like, you know, five people or something. Yes. Your question, you you asked, right? I, actually, you answered it. Oh, well, so, what was it? Well, it was just, uh, it was based on, you know, the performance uh, hits that you might take. Once, once your table sizes get to a certain level, you know, if you have a lot of triggers on those tables that are going to go ahead and parse out data, um, the potential problems that can occur for that. That's true, but what's nice is uh, that I can tempor uh, I can split my, my warehouse probably on specific time sections. Yeah. First, I, can, I even can run them in parallel. The nice part about what you're oh. saying is the fact that it's active, right? Yeah. In our company, what we do is that we will go ahead and load all this data into specific tables just kind of the raw data tables. Mm -hmm. Then we'll write applications that go through those tables, parse out information, handle that on the on the application side as opposed to the database side, update summary tables, event tables, et cetera, et cetera, based on that processing. Because you use application as a driver. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I, I so that's the you know, the nice thing about using, for example, C as your application to do that processing is that it's extremely fast. Mm -hmm. So you can slurp out the data from the database, process in arrays, insert into summary tables, and then you have your data. Right. What's really nice about what you're doing is that, although I think there's a performance hit there, is that it's, it's real time. You've got the information right away because as soon as that event comes in, you can push that trigger and insert into or, or do whatever you want with that for the event. I also like the idea of events because they mm, allow you to get rid of uh, raw data, sensor data. You have, I call it external application, which takes care of recognition things, essentially IDing, IDing the, the data. And once you have done it, um, the scan through the table is really, really very, very fast. Ah, I see. Okay, so you actually that, initially... That, 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 that's orthogonal to whether you use triggers or events, right? Because you could have several things are orthogonal here, right? Uh, horizontally par partitioning the table mm -hmm. by time yep. means mm -hmm. that you only need to process the most recent slice mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. time. The and most important usually. And yeah. maybe that's more enough so that you don't need to use trigger for that one. Right. Right, mm -hmm. and real time 
it's nice, but how often do you need it? So for instance, if you, you need to run something, ah, well, every 10 minutes is good enough, then how often would you not be able to finish scanning your most recent time slice of table in, say, a couple of minutes? You so still... To pick up all of your summary events. So having application to process the video files and generate this, yeah, but like it's essence of it. completely orthogonal mm -hmm. from using triggers or active databases. Yeah, this, right. is a, this has nothing to do with active databases because even if you don't use active databases, you can still right. have applications do that and insert this into some summary event table. And then that table, mm -hmm. you can use polling <laughs> against it. And the, pol the criticism of polling being in inefficient compared to events, that has to do with uh, your the time granular you care about. But let's, let's say events can be in, in inserted every few minutes, and you, you only really care every five or ten minutes or so, then you don't lose much. If it, it depends on what, what, what you care about, but in some situations you don't know. You just don't know, and you're trying to catch up when yes. it was Okay, let inserted. me ask this in a different way. Rather than me playing the other side, I'm going to ask you, when is it not necessary? to use triggers or active databases. Because you're you're making the case for the advantage <laughs> of using active databases. I would also like to ask, can you delineate when you don't need that? Um, you don't need it if it um, de degrades your performance. That's what, so, so there are two considerations, either performance or design. It complicates your design, it doesn't fit into your design, or degrades your performance. Originally, I thought that triggers significantly degrade your performance. I didn't find that, to, to my huge uh, amusement, and uh, amusement my SQL people, which really yes. amused me even more. Yes, that's a question of when it hurts, but the question I would like to ask is when you don't need it. Because in some cases, whether it hurts or not, if you don't need it, you don't need that in, in, in your design context. If you're comfortable to, to write it, uh, I don't see the big difference. Um, it is a different way of running your query. I understand. I'm not asking for a defense or critique of this. No, no, I'm not. But, but simply to see if you can, I see, I you see can what carve out of the space of applications, certain type of applications we don't need it, and for certain type of applications we need it. And where that, that partition see. space and more qualitative analysis of what kind of a frequency of updates we're dealing with, what kind of frequency of notification we care about, what granularity of notification we care about, and so on. I think the here is more in issues of control. If you want to retain control at client level, you don't use triggers because you're using your control over there. If you don't care about that, or even if you're happy with um, delegating control to the server, uh, that probably the um, water kind of mm -hmm. separation. Here. If you just don't care, you might use whatever, whatever. Yeah, that, 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 that's a good point, control. So when do we care to keep the control in the application? Then there is real time. And when you want information real time, actually when an event actually happens, say you are doing, uh, doing stock trading or something, you need that information to be there immediately so the next person has it. Right. Or so say, you, you cannot summarize it. You know? right, right, right. Real, so, so, so real time in favor of using triggers an active database and then wanting to keep control f fully within the client is in favor of not using it. What's an example where you want to keep that control in the client? For example, when you insert into a specific table and you have a trigger that will immediately filter out data that's going to insert into the table. So you prevent that insert from occurring. Therefore, you don't have to write an application afterwards, five or ten minutes later, that goes back and does cleanup, which will actually probably the trigger is actually more effective in that case. Right, right. but you, you're supplying example for the opposite case. Since you're, you, you bring out control, mm -hmm. uh, application control as a case where you might not use uh, one activate. Oh, uh, I'm looking for a oh, realistic If example. there is more processing that is involved, then definitely you will have client do it. Say, yeah, a, say yeah. a processing that takes five don't minutes. You can't right. wait don't want that. for someone to enter data for like five okay. minutes. You've got to wait for the record to go into the database. But it is That's still right. a little bit different. It's a perform. It, it sounds like there are multiple approaches. There is a performance. There is a control. Control like 
maybe security things or some control. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you don't want to insert and you want to decide it on the client side, not on the on the server side. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what I thought. So, so we're almost trying to fill out the table here, right? There, there is whether you want it real time and uh, whether the application has is long running and whether you want to control to recite with the application or the way we're still waiting for a real world example of that and then to see which one of these combinations you would like to use active database. But there are sometimes I think you there. cannot use triggers at all. It's like you can't scan the I think you can't scan the same table on which it is the event is firing. Right? Can you scan the same table as the event is firing? That was not possible, but I don't know whether it is now. There are so called because dependencies. Because so you're using, you're using the, the different access, uh, uh, access say rights. You, say you're entering a record in, right? And mm -hmm. uh, the number is 10. And you want to sum all the records. But then the sum is gives you 100. But it's not 100. It's only when you commit that it's going to be 100. Otherwise, it's going to be 90. So it's basically, you're in the trigger, you're in between the commit stage. You're not committed. So the output may, may be incorrect. You're scanning, and some databases don't allow that. Yeah. I would also uh, that's say it's not along the lines, like you were saying, where you control the data. You know, if you, say, are doing a credit card authorization, you know what I mean? I mean, this is kind of gets into, you know, I really see the application when, when you kind of get into where serializable stuff gets you into trouble, right? So you do a credit card authorization for $500, okay? Now my credit card has a credit limit of, you know, say, 1000 so I only have 500 left. Well, the money hasn't come out yet, but it's been authorized. So then I go buy something for $600, and I can't because it's what the authorization takes place. And then I say, oh, wait, cancel that one. But I, but I already can't have the $600 thing. So I have to go and do it again. So I might not want the authorization for the first authorization for to go into the database. You know, that's yeah. that kind of thing. I, you see, like, like the recovery or... Yeah, that roll, rolling, rolling things, you know, triggers that's difficult. Yeah. It's a shoot so that, yeah. that That's why where I would see you would use that kind of thing, uh -huh. where, yeah. where you wouldn't want that because the serializability kind of messes you up. Yeah, shoot forget. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I use the, the sound of shooting. <laughs> Once you shoot, there's no way to return boot. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Does that help? Yeah, that... Yeah, so you, you're trying to combine the two, two transactions into a single transaction within the application because the application gets a choice to uh, how, how, how to uh, serialize it. For example, right. if you separate it, right. you right. lose that control. If you, if you wanted the application to choose the serializability. Mm -hmm. Obviously, my example is a bad one for that kind of thought, but because um, you would never want to have the customer choose <laughs> the serializability of something like that. But for the, for the UDF, I could see if you have a situation where you know that you've got a demilitarized zone between your servers where you are capturing the information mm -hmm. and the area where you want to process your information. <coughs> if you've compiled what you need and it's local to the servers that are behind the DMZ, you grab at one time, you process at one time, but it's never reciprocated to the server from which you've gotten it. So that means mm -hmm. that once you're to that local to that server, you have the security that no one can mess with your your data that you've pulled locally, essentially because it's been spread with spread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <coughs> Does that make sense? Can you just repeat the whole part again? Oh, yeah. Depends on where the data came from. If yeah. It came that, um, and the server does know about that. Right, and. And so just like with Oracle and other systems, if you open up this functionality, you have to make sure that they can't overwrite anything that's near and dear to you. So people will keep their data behind a pseudo firewall that can only talk to their content servers. And they pull that data over and they use, say you through UDF, specific compiled applications that no one else can get to then they know that the data integrity of them is secure. Their data is secure because it's been pulled to them, not pushed. And you process it right there and then if that's what you need to do. And my question with the event and the triggers was more along the lines of, if you know that you have raw data coming in, but you're going to need to massage it several different times, you have to determine 
whether the triggers are useful after a certain number of rules, which if you want to call it business rules to make it make more sense, <coughs> you reach a point where it's not cost effective to too, too many business rules and then you have to look to the UDF application to say, okay, for everything else, once that trigger is fired, great, this is what comes along afterwards and does essentially the cleanup. That's how I saw it. Mm -hmm. You had a question, right? You. Oh, me? No. no. Yeah, that, uh, that, that is interesting. It, it is interesting that the theory of, uh, of these uh, events and all of that stuff was quite popular at the beginning of the 90s. There were a lot of work uh, related to that. And about 96, it started to die. It's no longer considered no longer fashionable, whatever, somehow. And now it is almost kind of forgotten. Uh, and I thought because uh, mm, we were be working a lot with monitoring, it was quite relevant. So how does this compare with the, uh, the theories on streaming databases? Streaming databases. There is a little bit of intersection. Uh, there is. Um, but the streaming databases use a different, a completely different approach. It's essentially not even a database. I would consider them as a, as a, as a filter with a SQL-like syntax. Sure. They, you move the data through them, and they, through that window, they analyze what, what you have. But some of, some of the, 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 the temporal semantics that they have are a little bit similar to the, uh, your event consumption uh, policies, right? That's true. You see, this area of event analysis somehow belongs to different domains. There is uh, artificial intelligence which definitely work with, with events and analyze them. Uh, there is uh, like streaming things. There are real-time databases which also work with real-time with, with events. Well, let's so it's so generic, it belongs to well, multiple... Artificial intelligence is not a generic term, right? All, all, all we, uh, we're saying here is uh, uh, we can build a production system on top of, uh, say, something like MySQL. Uh, yes, it's a generic term, I agree, but there is a quite popular application for artificial intelligence to recognize what, what, what it was, it, who was or something, what, what, what is there. And it uh, re uh, really relates to the data which you supply in analysis, and it's better to do that in real time. For That's why they have a, a checking of uh, checking of, of, of condition. If con is if this data satisfies the condition, but with active databases, they have event essentially, which is uh, created kind of outside of the database, and you use the event. To, 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 to fire the trigger. It's a little bit different than expert, syst expert systems. Yeah, not, that's what I meant, not AI, expert systems. Yeah, which is kind of real, analyze the data and classify them in some way. So it's similar to that. It is area of, uh, of diff multiple domains. Yeah, a Mike Stonebreaker actually uh, spends a lot of time in this area. And he started up the second company now in this area. Streambase, and now he started up another one. Uh, I forgot the name. Vertica. Vertica, yeah, yeah. Which is different, but... What, 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 does, what does the second one do? Oh, they now use a different way of uh, reading, reading, reading tables. Uh, Column-based reading. Not the record, but first yeah. column. Yeah. So... Also, there is a network database, which uh, somehow similar to that. Uh, oh, sensor, sorry, it's the sensor database, which is essentially kind of uh, streaming things, but not necessarily through the window. They are more full features databases. Yeah, this is an interesting topic, and. Uh, uh, Sometimes people work on the domain without knowledge that in another domain people already did. Yeah. So is there an example of a, a network 
database, sensor database company out there? I don't think there is a company, but there are projects which, um, which um, implemented that functionality. For example, in uh, um, California, in Berkeley, they developed, uh, they call it Tiny Oz. I think it is, if you search on Tiny, on Google, tiny Horse? Tiny Oz. OS. OS, sorry, <coughs> Tiny OS. Sorry. It is, done in, it is done in Java, implemented in Java. Uh, they use MATLAB in some strange way to do that. Um, oh, they used it, for example, they used this network or sensor database to automate bird watching. So you have, a, you, have a, you know, to watching when birds are flying like from the nest. It is important for the uh, bird, uh, for biologists. But it's that difficult to watch that stuff. <laughs> you have to sit and it's very unpleasant. So how to automate? In some way, it is not very far from what monitoring is about. Yeah. So mm, they have uh, like a sensor, uh, and uh, sensor supplies the data. Sensor, uh, it's a video camera or something which is located close to the nest, and somehow they. Um, uh, get that data and uh, maybe the mo there is a motion sensor or something like that which uh, turns on the camera. Um, it is a relatively slow process. That's why they don't care about performance. They even have a wireless connection between the camera and uh, the server, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the guy who developed that, who was one of the members of the team, actually got a position at MIT now, Sam Madden. If you search for that name, Sam Madden, yeah, I was at his presentation and I talked to him about some things. Um, all of that stuff, uh, the sensor, uh, and or the sensor database, really depends what which sensor you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And sensors are so different. Some of them supply one bit or one byte in an hour. And mm -hmm. I work with the sensors who su supply 25 megabytes per second. And they still sense us. Mm -hmm. And it's a completely different story. Yeah. So that's also the number of sensors mm. you're dealing with, because um, right. we have a similar system to monitoring uh, some of the security systems so, uh, for building access here at MIT. Mm -hmm. It all goes into a central database. Well, that makes sense. So it's sort of like a raw log that you're, you're dealing with at that given time. It's partially a raw log. Partially, it's also being duplicated to the video so that it mm -hmm. will pop up the right camera view to the uh, yeah. campus police. So as an event triggers and it's detected as an event, the right camera view is popped up. Oh, yeah. They can deal with that through monitoring. How many people are familiar with uh, video surveillance stuff? So I have a question for you. Sure. <laughs> if you s naturally store the data with compression, right? Yes. Yeah. And most of the cameras, if there's nobody getting through that door, is essentially the same view. It's a highly, highly compressible. Right. So do you use triggers on the compression rate as no. detections of events? Because whenever the compression rate changes? Because of the way our system's built, it's different components. So the video camera actually is recording to uh, one system and that's triggering an event in that system, and that sends off a network packet to our event monitoring system. Right, so I, I'm, saying, I'm saying even without going to more sophisticated uh, analysis, just where in order to store these things, even though you're doing a lot of compressions all over the place, mm -hmm. there ought to be a very cheap sensor of some type that compression rate changes, compression rate changes, compression. In a lot well, of cases, you send the and, and, then, and, and then that could trigger more sophisticated analysis. I'm just curious whether anybody has done that. Well, the way, uh, at least the way our uh, is, is it's taking sort of like uh, what the, what you see on TV for the um, uh, ATM cameras. It's not you know a full video stream. It's you know a snapshot, 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 and so it's detecting a change between snapshot A and snapshot B. Right. And, and send the deltas. Yeah. And yeah, usually the deltas they send some, some sensors just built to send only deltas. Yeah. Moreover, right. they yeah. build and, 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 then, <coughs> and then the data rate will become yeah. a, a Yeah, right. and they, they also send you the full frame 
like one in a minute, because a lot of deltas are not good. <laughs> yeah, you have yeah. to have this uh, frame, or you call it base frame. Yeah, and that, but it reduces significantly. Yeah, I was thinking of something, but I can't remember where I saw it, where there was a guy who had a cat door, and he didn't want his cat to bring anything in but itself. So mm -hmm. he knew the pattern and the shape of his cat, and there was an image, and if there was anything that, that had bigger than that space, that, no. that it wouldn't open. So the cat could have a burn in its mouth, and it learned that it couldn't get it in. So it could get, maybe there was like maybe something inside its mouth, but if, it, if, its, silhouette oh, didn't, yeah. if its silhouette did not match, it was not let in. And therefore, not, and that meant that raccoons couldn't get in, skunks couldn't get in, other things that weren't pattern matching the shape of the cat. Huh. Okay. But uh, how cats learn about that? Cats should understand that, oh, I'm bringing something. That's why it does allow me to come in. <laughs> uh, all I know is that, that it was really cool that he had he out that it, he that he out. kept the cat out. You will learn out of the office. You need one of those in my office. So you so find out right? where it is. We're going to die on a track as something crosses the line. line. And that's mostly how it's used. Yeah. I mean, you can get something yeah. crossing this line. If it's crossed that line. Yeah, and it does a quick. Pattern match is this the cat? Is this the cat plus a bird? Uh, just, just a quick side story that I actually want to build a bigger monitoring system because recently somebody crashed my car and I had to run on the street right in front of my apartment. Mm -hmm. So I'm That's thinking you it wouldn't be so expensive to build a video monitor just that spot mm -hmm. because most of the time the image doesn't change. So right. that yes. it, it, so you could almost have like a motion sensor kind of thing. Right. But the motion sensing just comes from, it's adaptive, right? If something changes, there's more frames captured because right. that's so, the data. So the simple solution is to get a big hard drive and just stream the video to it right. and look at it. Yeah. Having a hard drive that could fit a day or two right. a week or how long. Yeah. But, but what, 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 what? just, you know, chase your tail and, you know, periodically scan through it with some kind of software. But what this video gives to you, if somebody hits your car, video is not going to help. Well, show you the color of the car. Well, what kind of car they are. What because also when people do that, sometimes, are you going they, to sometimes, use sometimes it? they may come out and take a look. Yeah, yeah. but that or might not the, even uh, be admissible or anything because in Massachusetts there are the third party laws where you can't, like I know you can't audio record, I don't well, know about yeah, video record. But it doesn't have to be used as evidence, right? Because if you, you have an information... They might sure. throw everything out. No, 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 but at least that's legally that would count as uh, free from the po uh, poison from the blood or fruit of the poison tree, as because the video surveillance itself is illegal, information gained from the video yes, surveillance. Video surveillance. I mean, you may you may not be able to. Yeah, yeah, it's illegal. Yeah, it's illegal. Because yeah. unless you have signs saying very big signs saying this is under surveillance, because they have to know that in Massachusetts all the parties involved have to know if they're being taped. So well, you're all being taped, by the way, because... <laughs> but you only have to. So it's even better. You don't, you don't so need a camera. Just put the sign. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's interesting, actually, because my workplace had video <clears throat> cameras, and like a month or two later, they put a sign there, and I said, why did the sign go up now when the video cameras went a month or two ago? And they said, oh, legally they have to. And I said, or maybe something happened yes. that they had to, you know, they wanted to put the signs, because the sign probably does more than the actual video camera. So... What exactly is illegal? It's it's not that it's illegal, but it, you can't you can't trust any information. You know, like a court won't yeah, trust yeah. any information that's, that's gotten okay. from a recording, whether but it's audio I or video. I suppose I never present that. That's fine. I mean, if you go after the guy and you say, "I that's, saw that, you that, hit my car," that, that's fine. That's let's go through the insurance company. I got, companies I got his work. license plate. Right. I have someone track on where he is. Yeah. I go to his car and take a photo of the damage, which matches. You know the pieces of no, because you got that from the video. You can't get any, like you said, it's it's the the poison fruit of the but tree. Any you any information you get from that. Tree. Yeah, you can There's say. There's nobody that. even knows what I have. You can say you saw it from your window and yeah. you didn't want to approach him. So right. How yeah. I mean, that from taking a picture and whenever there's an accident, we take pictures, right? How right. different is that from we? No, no. I, I I'm saying the video allows me to pretend that I actually saw it and basically track them down to collect additional right. evidence and there's no way to prove that it was poison. Well, right. yes, there's no way to prove unless, you know, somebody else happens to know you're running a video camera there. Right, but or happens to know you were at work that yeah, day yeah. or whatever. 
it, so, it's, so I built a system once. That have someone else run the video camera, so it's yeah. not you. Well, I mean, I, ideally, right, you could post this on a building, right, because hit, um, how often do hit and runs happen? Ideally, though, this would be great for when you're, when it's snowing and you shovel out your spot and then somebody comes and takes your spot. Like, that would be a great kind of thing, just to like... And everybody else would go mental anyway. But then you know who's in your spot. You yes, that's there, true. But, you know. The funniest thing that happened with our video surveillance system is we had the sit camera sitting there, it was all mounted in the wall, and they were doing some construction in the building. And you could see them putting in the new wall, and they walled up the camera and took the camera away. <laughs> well, they didn't take it away, they just walled no, it up. They, no, they walled it up and took the camera away. <laughs> Aren't they not supposed to touch stuff like that? Yeah. That's, you know, so we've got it recorded that, you know, they right. took the camera away. <laughs> Basically, it sounds like you, you're having, it sounds like you're, ha you, you're having a very expensive solution to a problem uh, that probably won't happen again. <laughs> no, 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 happen again. But I thought it was a, it, 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 it's right. an interesting... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it says it's an easy thing to do. And the other thing to do uh, to help your compression is, because, like you said, you don't need to record every frame and the frames don't change for long periods of time, you don't even need to record the entire video um, chain. You just need to be able to have a buffer and say, oh, mm -hmm. things have changed. They call From the beginning of my buffer to you know when things changed and mm -hmm. for however much time mm -hmm. afterwards. Right. Yeah. And that so would be very useful section. for monitoring things like data yeah. centers where you know yep. right. your cage isn't you know because your street there's always cars driving on the street that might be a hard thing to do where there's a bird flying by or whatever, um, there, or even wind or might cat cause the, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> or cat with the birds. <laughs> it all comes back. All um, comes back. But something like a data center or something you know that's not supposed to move you know, a museum pieces or something at night. And if you've got, like, money to splurge, you could always say, you know, if you wanted deltas or your deltas, NetApps have always had this really cool feature called snapshotting over time. Your file changes, you know, so you could really, you wouldn't have to keep as much data around, you just have to keep your snapshots around. But with an 80 gig hard drive and 10 video cameras in one building, I've got uh, two years' worth of uh, video surveillance data. Oh, well, that's good to know. So what's the You've got a good data what's the point for those? Um, <coughs> it's, um, okay. I mean, relatively, you'd be able to see a face. I mean, what? Yeah, you can see a face. You know, you probably couldn't see an ID card if it was flashed. You couldn't zoom in no. on the numbers or whatever. You know, a no, license plate. Yeah, but no, it's not good enough resolution to read somebody's right? book. Yeah, I mean, you can but I can those definitely get a uh, recognition of the person. Right, right. So it's mostly face level granularity. You're yeah. not going to. You know, you're not going to see the word written on, you know, their tattoo on their arm or, you know. So, the weather.